Now for an overview of our webinar. So I'll start off by giving a quick overview of the East Bay mud water supply and watershed. I'll also talk a little bit about our current drought and some actions that we all can take to conserve water. I'll then hand the webinar off to Suzanne, who will teach us all about spring garden maintenance, what we're all here for. And then I'll review our East Bay Mud rebates and coupon programs that might be of interest. And then finally, we will answer questions and wrap up the webinar with some upcoming events. So where does our water come from? Well, if like me, you're in the East Bay Mud service area right now, your water actually comes from the McCullamy River watershed, which is in the Sierra Nevadas. And the McCullamy River watershed, it contains 627 square miles of pristine protected watershed. And at East Bay Mud, 90% of our water is actually from snowmelt, which points to how important snow is for our water supply. And our water um, system supplies up to 325 million gallons of water daily, which is quite a lot. So this is a zoomed out map of our water system. So you can see the McCullamy River watershed up in the corner and raw and untreated water is transported from our upcountry reservoirs over 90 miles via these three large aqueducts to the East Bay water treatment plants and our terminal reservoirs in the East Bay. And from there, the water is pushed out throughout the full service area until it ends up at your household. Also, you'll see on here up in the top, in 2002, we added the Freeport Regional Water Facility. It was created so that East Bay Mud can access supplemental water supplies from the Sacramento River during times of drought. Like right now, we have actually been getting supplemental water um, to supplement you know, the low, drier conditions. Here's a map of our East Bay mud water and wastewater service area here in the Bay Area. And we as a water utility provide service to 1.4 million water customers, as well as 740,000 wastewater customers. We maintain over 4,200 miles of pipe and have over 400,000 active water meters. So it's a pretty big operation. And you've probably heard about it. You can see my dry background, but since last April, we've been in a declared stage one drought. And with that, we've been asking our customers to come together and reduce water consumption by 10% voluntarily. And we do really thank our customers for conserving over the past year. In the fall and um, the end of the summer, we were meeting our 10% savings goal. But so far in 2022, with almost no rain, we're now falling a bit below this benchmark. So we really do ask everyone to come together and do what they can to save water. Um, and this graph here just shows that you can see in October and December, we got a lot of precipitation in our watershed, almost double normal. But since then, January, February, and March, have been incredibly dry, as I'm sure you all have experienced. And with that, um, we're still seeing what our total system storage will look like for the next year. And our board of directors will come together as they do in annually in late April to hear the final water supply projections for the next year. And if it's necessary, the board may indicate that we need to increase our drought stage or stay where we're at in a stage one drought. Or if you know we got an incredibly rainy, rainy March and April, though unlikely, you know, they could declare the drought to be over. So since we're in a drought, what can you do? 
Well, we can all take some really simple actions like finding and fixing leaks in our home, checking our, you know, our toilets and irrigation systems for leaks primarily. We can all install efficient fixtures like efficient shower heads or aerators on our faucets. We can make some small behavior changes like shorter showers. I always recommend getting a five minute shower song or you know, even a playlist to listen so that you can make sure your showers are, are concise. And then more than anything else, what we can do why we're here today is focus on the landscape and focus on our outdoor water use since that's where we can see perhaps the most savings by making some really simple changes to how we irrigate and maintain our landscapes. And with that, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to our, our partner, Suzanne Bontempo, to introduce herself and teach us all about spring guarded maintenance. Thank you so much, Geneva. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm really honored to be here to uh, help you with some uh, spring garden tasks that can help your garden thrive, increase the health of your plants, and also with the intention of reducing the water usage in the garden. So uh, let's get started. I. Uh, with the agenda that I have for us this afternoon and what I'd like to share is some spring gardening tasks that are very easy to tackle. I'm also going to talk a little bit about adjusting the irrigation for the season. I'm also going to share the importance of adding compost, utilizing mulch, and feeding our plants with organic fertilizers. Uh, and then we're going to uh, discuss a little bit on how we can keep weeds in check we're going to talk briefly about growing food. For those of us that like to grow food, what would be the best uh, types of food crops to grow? And then uh, a brief note on plants that can attract beneficial insects and pollinators. And then uh, Geneva will go through the East Bay mud resources and rebates. And then, of course, we're going to save a lot of time at the end for all of your great questions. Next. So as the program uh, manager for Our Water, Our World, I'd just like to introduce everyone to this really awesome program if you're not already familiar with it. It is a program that partners with retailers and provides education for the retailer and for the public about less toxic pest management and alternatives to the toxic pesticides that pollute the waterways. You might recognize this program in your local garden center or hardware store. We will have, uh, as, as the picture on the left shows, a literature rack that has these one sheets that discuss and address how to resolve some common pest problems like ants or aphids. And then, um, tips on how to grow a healthy garden or how to grow beautiful roses and so forth, all with a less toxic approach. You can certainly scan the QR codes that are on the screen right now. And then you might also notice the shelf talkers, uh, the little blue shelf talkers that we will place under eco-friendly products that will help guide you to a product that you know will be less toxic and not um, uh, a product that will um, leach into our waterways to cause more problems. You can find more information at the Our Water, Our World website. And how I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, Geneva was talking about our watersheds, and I always like to kind of relate our gardens to a watershed. And so on our gar in our gardens or on our property, when we do have rain uh, during and after a rain event, or in the event a sprinkler's broken or for power washing the house, there's going to be excess amount of water that's going to run off uh, the property. And it can um, then move down the driveway or down the walkways into the storm drain. If you happen to live in a neighborhood that doesn't have sidewalks, then it's going to drain to a, the nearest stream or creek. But along the way, it's also picking up any um, litter or debris we might have on our property, uh, pet waste, but more importantly, any um, synthetic uh, fertilizers or 
chemical pesticides that we've used will have residuals that will also get swept with that water and run off and enter the storm drains. So the big intention of the Our Water, Our World program is to guide uh, people to uh, use products that will be extremely effective, but will not have those harmful residuals that can impair the waterways. And we teach integrated pest management principles, also known as IPM. And IPM is a decision make. Uh, uh, it's a decision making process, and we use science based strategies to solve the pest problems. And this would be around the home and garden. Today, we are focusing on the garden. And so uh, what IPM um, helps us see is that oftentimes what we think is the problem is actually symptoms of the problem. So by these, uh, with these principles, we are uh, guided to identify what the problem is. We absolutely wanna always have proper identification and then from there, we can ask a few more questions like, is this a problem that we can live with or is it a problem that's going to be short lived? From there, we look at prevention. How can we prevent this problem from happening again or how can we prevent it from getting any worse? So we know spring is upon us and aphids are starting to pop up all over the place. Aphids are not a pest in my eyes. I actually see them food for beneficial insects. However, there's a threshold. If the aphids have a tendency to over uh, populate and overrun my roses, for instance, then I might need to take some action. But having some aphids in my garden is actually a good sign. That means it's food for my beneficial insects and my beneficial insects are going to keep the garden in balance. But if we do need to take action, the action steps in IPM are called controls. So we would look at cultural controls, which is increasing the health of the garden, uh, which I will be sharing some tips with you in a moment. And and then we'd also look at mechanical controls. And these would be the tools we use to manage the pests, such as traps and barriers and other tools. Uh, biological controls would be inviting beneficial uh, living organisms to manage uh, the pest problems, such as beneficial insects. And then chemical controls, which are going to be the pesticides. We're always going to choose eco-friendly, less toxic options. And we're always going to use this as a last resort when we've really exhausted all of the other uh, steps. So that's just uh, a little bit of IPM in a nutshell for those of you that are not as familiar with it. Okay, next slide. And so what we're, um, I'm going to share with you today is some spring garden maintenance. This is going to be very, uh, just a very brief overview. Each one of these topics could certainly uh, afford a, an entire all day lecture, but I'm going to keep it really brief. We're going to look at uh, the importance of building healthy soil. We're also going to look at protecting the root zone of our plants during times of drought and when things uh, get unseasonably warm and or dry, protecting the root zone is going to be key. We're gonna look at the importance of feeding our plants with organic fertilizers, and now is the time. We're gonna look at how uh, tips for watering the root zones of our plants deeply, and we're going to look at planting climate appropriate plants. We're also going to uh, look at providing some healthy garden practices and the importance of inviting beneficial insects. So many of us are looking at maybe turning the irrigation systems on. It's been dry for a while. We haven't had a lot of rains. However, uh, if we can hold off until uh, you know a couple more weeks and wait until April to turn those systems on, that would be better. And if we do need to uh, you know, spot water here and there, give yourself permission to do so. However, when we turn those irrigation clocks back on, something we wanna understand is that these are not set it and forget it systems. So the, uh, the program that you had uh, set last fall is that timing might very well be different to what the watering needs are right now. So what we wanna do is we're gonna turn on the system and we're going to get out there and we're going to manually 
uh, inspect the entire system to make sure everything is working in you know perfect order. If we have pop-up sprinklers, we're going to seriously consider switching to drip. Drip is going to be much more effective and efficient at watering our plants, specifically the root zones. Um, it's going to actually reduce the weeds on our property because we're only watering where we really want that water to go. And it's going to save us a lot of money because we're not going to be using as much water. We're going to be actually saving water when we switch to drip. So please uh, look into that. The best time to uh, set our irrigation systems and to water is really just at sunrise. Um, I know that some of the water municipalities will say 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. However, I would like to share the best time to water our gardens is really that uh, the sunrise hours at 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. We could push it to seven, but really with the very early hours of the morning when the uh, soil and air temperatures are still cool. And then um, the plants have an entire, you know, day and evening to to really um, allow that water to infiltrate and saturate the soil. So the best time to water is in the morning. Uh, we absolutely want to avoid evening watering because evening watering um, has a tendency to attract slugs and snails, earwigs, and also uh, certain diseases like black spot and rust. So to reduce pest problems, again, the best time to water is going to be early in the morning. So we want to inspect those irrigation systems. It is not unusual for uh, breaks in the system or leaks in the system. I just noticed a leak today that just happened while I was inspecting my irrigation systems uh, in preparation of turning it back on. Um, we also want to uh, adjust any emitter placement. So where the water is coming out of the irrigation tubing, we want to adjust that and maybe we need to move it out a little wider because the plants have grown. We wanna always focus that water at the drip line of the plant. What is the drip line? Well, it's the outer edges of the branches. So look at the outer edges of your rows when it's at full growth, not when we've pruned it back, or the outer edges of our apple trees or shrubs or perennials, uh, whatever that outer edge is going to be. The only difference would be a creeping ground cover where we would actually want to have a variety of um, you know, a number of emitters uh, within that uh, ground cover, but all other plants, we want to make sure we're watering out at the drip line and that we might need to uh, add a few more emitters because when we water, we want to make sure we're getting nice, even uh, distribution of water all the way around and that we're able to water deeply and not water again until the top few inches of that soil is dry. We may also need to remove some emitters as needed. So just keep this in mind. Next slide. By all means, what I really want to share is that if we have emitters at the crown of the plant, which is right where the stem or the trunk of the plant meets the root system, that is the crown, we always want to avoid watering right there because this can lead to crown rot and root rot. And actually this is going to uh, decrease the lifespan of the plant significantly. So uh, please go out and inspect, make sure debris has been removed from the base of our plants. We always want to have that crown to be exposed to air circulation. We want to feel that mat of roots. And then we will uh, have mulch, compost and mulch. Uh, we'll, we'll start to protect those root zones. We'll be uh, applying it about three to 12 inches beyond the crown, depending on the plant material. And if we have emitters at this crown, well, we're gonna to wanna to remove that, plug it and bring emitters out uh, a good foot. In this case, it's gonna be about a foot from the trunk because that's where the edge of this um, arborvitaes is. 
All right. And uh, East Bay Mud has this awesome schedule. It's a watering schedule. It is in English and in Spanish. Uh, but uh, what we want to share is that this is just a starting point. So we might look right here on the schedule that for a lawn, and if we have pop-up sprinklers, we might have it set for one day a week right now. And for the landscape, you'll see that it's still off. So for drip irrigation, we should still have our irrigation off for the landscape. However, um, as we move into the you know following weeks and into April, we'll see that that irrigation would be set for one day a week. And it says it would be three cycles for 30 minutes. So that means we would have, uh, we could have it go on at four in the morning and then it will go on for 30 minutes and then it could come back on at five in the morning for 30 minutes and then it could come back on at six in the morning for 30 minutes. So it's three cycles for 30 minutes. Um, similarly, the lawn is going to be three cycles, uh, each cycle being about three to six minutes. Now, this is just a starting point and I'll share why in a moment. So the watering needs are going to um, depend on a lot of factors. So one question that uh, we as professional um, garden people, uh, professional nursery people and professional horticulturalists get all the time is, how often do I need to uh, water my plants? Well, we can tell you how much the plant really wants once established, however, it's going to be very difficult for us to tell you how often to water or how often to set your irrigation systems now, because it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the types of plants that you have in your garden. Uh, if they are uh, separated by hydrozones, meaning are uh, plants with similar water ne needs grouped together. Um, are the plants that we're watering um, how established are these plants? Are they, have they been in the ground for longer than a year or are they young plants that we just planted last fall? Because that's going to also dictate how frequent we water. Those root systems have not become exactly established yet. Perennials, it could take a whole year for the root zones to become established, whereas shrubs could be up to three years and trees could be up to five years. So during that time, we're going to provide uh, deep watering, but at a closer frequency than we would once established. And then depending on what the water needs of that plant are once established, we will then adjust accordingly. Okay, so this is really important to understand. What are the water needs of the plant material once established? From there, it's also going to depend on the texture of your soil. You know, watering soil that's heavy clay and um, the frequency of watering again will be much different than the frequency of watering sandy loam. Sandy loam is going to dry out uh, more quickly than clay. And then, do you have a two to three inch layer of mulch covering the root zone uh, of the soil around your plants? If so, then you're going to reduce the frequency of how often you water significantly. So you might only be watering once every other week right now. The air temperatures are still cool and we still have shorter daylight hours. So understand that we, though we might have a few hot days here and there, uh, the root zones, especially with that three inch layer of mulch are staying cool and moist and we do not need to water as often. Um, and if you're not sure, go ahead and stick your fingers in that soil to see and make sure that you check before you water again. Our gardens, the microclimates of our gardens are also going to dictate how frequently we water. It really depends on how the sun is moving across our gardens, how, uh, where the shade is being cast in the afternoon or in the morning. Is there a wind tunnel? Does that four o'clock in the afternoon wind blast through one section of my garden, drying those plants out more often? Or are a lot of my plants planted up against uh, a fence or the side of the house where it really holds on to the heat? 
And then also the grade of the garden will dictate uh, the frequency of watering. So if we've got plants at the bottom of a grade, they're gonna have a tendency to stay wet longer because the water from above the grade will have run off and um, been captured at the lower sections of the garden. So please have a look, get out there, get curious, inspect your irrigation needs, inspect the emitters, making sure they're working and make sure that all the plants are getting nice and even watering and that we're checking the soil to make sure we're only watering when the soil and the root zones need it. Here is a illustration of what I'm talking about. So we want to grow nice, deep, healthy root systems, okay? And root systems are only going to go where the water goes. So if we're watering shallowly, uh, where, you know, unfortunately, uh, sometimes people think because of, uh, we're in times of drought, we're going to water, you know, like three minutes every day where it's just really, really shallow uh, and it's not really saturating or really infiltrating deeply in the soil. Well, that's actually quite uh, the incorrect way to water and it's uh, absolutely not saving any water. It's actually doing more harm than good. So what we wanna do is we really want to encourage nice deep root systems. We're gonna water deeply and we're going to encourage roots to grow wide. And then we're not going to water again uh, until the soil is uh, three to four inches dry. And this is on established plants, okay? So especially with that three inch of mulch on top, again, this could take a number of days, if not weeks for that root zone to actually need water again. And we can absolutely uh, save water and uh, be extremely water wise while building healthy soils with compost. Compost is uh, organic matter that we can purchase in bags. Uh, it would be, uh, brands could be um, like soil amendment or planting mix or uh, gardening compost. These are all compost. Uh, remember that soil should not be an afterthought and our goal is to increase the organic matter in the soil by about 5%. We don't need to have more than that. 5% is a great goal for us and uh, easy way to get to add 5% uh, organic matter to our soil is we lay out an inch of compost uh, on top of uh, so a bare planting bed and then we just turn it into the top you know, four inches or so, okay? That's gonna be a really easy way to integrate and amend the soil and get that organic matter in there. The reason why we love compost is because it's increasing the microbiology in the soil. And the microbiology in the soil is key for increasing the health of the plant. Uh, it's also, when we add compost to the soil, regardless if it's sand or clay, we're able to uh, increase the water infiltration. So we're able to make the soil more like a sponge. We're able to allow that water to actually uh, move a little deeper into, um, into those root zones and actually uh, stay there. Um, in a healthy way, okay? So uh, it's going to increase the amount of water that can be stored in the soil. And actually with that additional microbiology, that microbiology is helping the root systems with the nutrient exchange, as well as with the water exchange, but on a molecular level. So if there's nothing else you do to your garden, please add compost because it is a win-win. And then we're going to protect the soil with mulch. So the mulch I'm speaking of is going to be uh, a layer of organic material, such as wood chips, chunky wood chips, not shredded cedar and not shredded redwood because those two have a tendency to be extremely combustible. But I'm talking about a chunky wood chip mulch that you can get at your local landscape supply. You could also buy wood chips in bags at your local garden center, or you can get it in bulk 
from a, a landscape yard. You might even know an arborist that will have maybe recently chipped some tree branches and then that is going to be perfect. The reason why we want to work with a chunky wood mulch, of course, um, something to share is that we always want to check with our local fire ordinances to see what are the recommendations for uh, applying mulch around our properties. But mulch is um, really fantastic. When we do not have a protective layer of mulch on top of the soil, what happens is that sun dries out the very top of the soil, creating kind of like a crust, so to speak and dry soil becomes very hydrophobic. So in the event we do water with the hose or sprinkler, or we get rains, what we see is that that water very quickly is going to run off. It's going to pool and move. So um, what we want to do is actually put that nice two to three inch layer of mulch on top of the soil, which will now allow that water to infiltrate with ease without running off. We also uh, want to understand that uh, that mulch is going to protect the soil. It's going to uh, prevent erosion and compaction, but it's also going to reduce the water evaporation rate significantly. OK, and it actually reduces uh, the amount of water you use in the garden by at least 20 percent. OK, so for everyone that needs to cut back 10 percent voluntarily, well, guess what? When we add mulch to our garden, we're already reducing 20 percent. So that's the easy that's easy to do in the garden. Um, I will also share that, especially in some of our warmer areas around the uh, East Bay, uh, the mulch that two to three inch layer of mulch is also going to keep the root zones really cool. So if we have that layer of mulch on top of the soil and it's 85 degrees, if we dig down four inches, it's going to be 10 degrees cooler. So that's going to be fantastic for uh, keeping those temperatures regulated for our plants so that the plants can continue to stay healthy and function as they need to. One caveat is, is we always want to make sure we do not put any mulch or uh, anything for that matter up around the crown of the plant, as I mentioned before. Okay, we always want to keep the mulch away from any plant stems and the crown. And what is perfect is right now, uh, this is the time to feed our I see there's a typo, organic rose fertilizers. This is for all the flowers, not just roses. So any plants, fruit trees, we want to feed with organic fertilizers. We want to uh, uh, apply those organic fertilizers now around the root zones uh, with the dry fertilizer. These are the fertilizers that look like uh, kind of crushed uh, oatmeal. And the reason why is because we're actually feeding the soil microbes in that soil. And those soil microbes then have that beautiful symbiotic relationship with the root zones where they can offer that exchange for, um, you know, and, uh, and allow the plants to take nutrients on an as need basis. Organic fertilizers also prevent growth spurts that can attract pests. So understand synthetic fertilizers actually act a little bit like steroids for plants, and it's going to stimulate a lot of new growth, which is very attractive to pests like aphids and other um, insects. So avoid that. And then slow release. Um, these organic fertilizers will slowly release nutrients in a more natural way and absolutely will not run off to contaminate our waterways. Liquid fertilizers are a great option during the growing season. So I've added my uh, dry fertilizers to my flowering plants and I've added some earthworm castings to further enhance the nutrients. And then through the growing season, especially for my roses and my vegetables and my citrus, which 
all seem to be a little bit more heavy feeders. I will uh, apply a liquid fertilizer that I mix with my watering can, and then we'll saturate the root zones of those plants. Now remember, uh, if that fertilizer turns blue or green when you add water to it, it's not organic and it's going to be rather high in salts, which will be really detrimental to our uh, the soil around the root zone, especially as we get into um, the hot, dry summer months. And then we want to keep weeds in check. We did get those beautiful rains back in October and December. So I don't know about you, but I've been pretty much only pulling weeds, okay? So we want to uh, take advantage of all the different type of weeding tools that are on the market. There are so many. And, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that you have to get on your hands and knees by all means, but find the tools that really are comfortable for you to use. We want to uh, tackle these weeds when they are young because that's when they're very easy to pull or to uh, scrape or to use uh, a gardening hoe. Uh, of course, we always want to work uh, the soil and pull weeds or manage weeds when the soil is dry. We don't want to get out there when the soil is wet because we can actually compact that soil. Um, and then once the weeds get a little taller and they're, we're really looking at weeds that are you know three, four, five inches tall, we really want to take advantage of those line trimmers and mowers. It's best just to get out there and mow or trim those weeds. Um, but by all means, do what you have to without uh, letting them go to seed. And then uh, another great tool is suppressing the weeds with sheet mulching. Uh, sheet mulching is when we leave those we weeds in place and we layer cardboard and then we apply uh, no less than three inches of mulch on top. And I understand that there's a workshop next month that goes into uh, quite extensively how to sheet mulch. So please sign up for that workshop. It's one of my favorite tools to utilize around the garden. And then uh, if you're like me, I like to grow a lot of food. So if you're looking to grow more food in the garden, a couple tips is one, uh, let's plant our food crops a little closer together as in this picture, because those leaves are actually acting as a living mulch and shading the root zones to keep those root zones cooler and to reduce water evaporation. And then um, I'm a huge fan of choosing heirloom varieties. Heirlooms refer to a plant that is open pollinated, non-GMO and not hybridized. So you can go to the local garden center and oftentimes it'll say right there on the tag or on the seed packet heirloom. And if you're not sure, you can ask or look it up, but these are ideal for our climate because most heirloom varieties come from Mediterranean climates that are also summer dry and these will adapt to our California uh, summer dry climate and uh, be more drought tolerant and will uh, reduce the frequency of watering. And then from there, we want to invite in our beneficial insects, our pollinators, our birds, and other garden allies. They are all going to provide an amazing service, which will help uh, uh, take care of a lot of the pests that we see in the garden, as well as pollinate our flowers, which can increase the yields of our food crops. Flowers that we want to add to our garden is always going to be a variety of shapes and colors and sizes uh, from low growing to tall growing. But uh, keep in mind what's really important for a lot of our micro pollinators is going to be flowers that have uh, that are in clusters of a tiny flower such as the yarrow or the sweet alyssum or flowers that look like a sunflower or a daisy. For instance, the gallardia and the erigeron here, that might look like one flower or like for instance, my aster in my background, that might look like one flower. However, those petals are actually rays and that cone, that button in the middle is hundreds and hundreds of tiny flowers and that's going to uh, be the nectar and pollen source for our pollinators and many of our beneficial insects. 
And here's a list of some flowers. This is just a very brief list. There are so many uh, plants beyond this, but again, flowers that look like a daisy or a sunflower and flowers that grow in clusters of tiny flowers. And then if we're uh, wanting to attract butterflies and hummingbirds and larger bees, we can also then expand into small and large tubular flowers, such as the fuchsias and the salvias and so forth. And this will then also uh, provide pollination and uh, nectar to our larger pollinators. And this is just a little sample of some flowering plants I have in my garden. So the Nyphophia, the Agastaches, the Cestrum, Snapdragons, Abutilon, Verbena, Coreopsis, Scabiosa, another variety of ver Verbena, and the Tithonia. These are all getting a lot of attention from the pollinators in my garden, including the hummingbirds. And something I can share if, uh, we're looking just to add one uh, additional plant to our garden. Let's make it a habitat hero. What is ideal is that we can favor California natives. California natives not only are going to be climate appropriate um, and require less water once established, but they're also going to provide higher nutrition for our native pollinators and the entire garden ecology. So uh, buckwheat, manzanita, our California native oaks, uh, ceanothus or California lilac, sages, and culinary herbs. When we let them all go to flower, they are... Um, they, they bring a lot of bang for their buck. So I just like to give them a shout out. And then as I mentioned before, uh, pest proper pest identification is essential. If we're not able to identify the pest, it's going to be really challenging to actually uh, manage that pest to control it or suppress it. And um, understanding that over 90%, uh, actually closer to 98% of the insects that we see in the garden are all beneficial. There's just a few that are pests and those pests are typically very seasonal. So it's really important when we're out there to uh, properly identify the insects, to understand the life cycles of those insects, uh, learn about the pest habitat and the time of that pest so that we could uh, reduce the pest or prevent it from um, causing any problems. And then we also want to uh, get curious and see, are there any of the natural enemies? Do we have our beneficial insects present? Because then that will really share that if those, if our beneficial insects are present, then we do absolutely do not need to use pesticides to solve the problem. We just let them take care of it. And then for some resources to help us identify proper pest identification and management, we have the Our Water, Our World website. Please check that out for those fact sheets. We have the UCIPM website, which is a wealth of information with many, many uh, pests that we can um, get coached on and guided to resolve. And then if we have an insect in our garden that we can't identify, we can reach out to bugguide.net for uh, proper identification. And then for help on how active ingredients uh, of pesticides work, we can also go to the National Pesticide Information Center. Okay, thank you so much, Suzanne. I always learn so much and I love all the pictures of those habitat heroes and pollinating plants. So now we're, I'm going to speak a little bit to some of the East Bay Mud resources and rebates that you might be able to take advantage of as you work to maintain your garden or potentially even transform a lawn. So at East Bay Mud, we do offer landscape rebates and the total amount is up to $2,000 for residential properties and up to $15,000 for commercial properties. And so if you are considering doing an irrigation upgrade, so doing something like Suzanne mentioned and converting existing sprinklers to drip irrigation or perhaps getting a smart self-adjusting controller, like Suzanne mentioned, we do offer rebates for those items. So as you can see here, we offer rebates for additionally for 
you know, high efficiency sprinkler nozzles and also pressure regulators and irrigation submeters. And we will provide information about these in the follow-up email as well. Beyond the irrigation rebates, we also offer a lawn conversion rebate. So this is a rebate per square foot of lawn converted to a low water use garden. And it requires that you convert an existing turf lawn area into an area that's gonna be, have at least 50% low water use plants and drip irrigation or hand watering. And of course that you add mulch. And just this past summer, we actually started a new pilot rebate called the super rebate. And as you can see, it's double the amount. So it's $1.50 per square foot. And it requires a few additional requirements that are all in line with this presentation, but that you put in a majority California native so that they're climate adapted, that you plant in the cool season, that you use compost and you use sheet mulching. So you use that cardboard compost and mulch um, to convert your lawn. And I saw a question in the chat initially of, you know, some demos and here's one, um, someone in our, one of our customers who converted a lawn to a water wise landscape. And I just, you know, you can see how much color they've added, so much interest. Um, and we do also have, I'm going to speak to them at the end, but some upcoming events and some upcoming garden tours in the service area that you all might be interested in if you want more examples of really fantastic water-wise gardens and ideas for converting your lawn. Additionally, we at East Bay Mud do offer mulch and compost coupons. So this is in partnership with local nurseries and different nurseries offer coupons just for East Bay Mud customers um, for either bulk or bagged items, depending on the store. And you can learn more and download the coupons on our website at ebmud.com slash mulch. So if you're getting out there um, and want to buy your products, definitely check out the coupons. So in summary, we covered a lot today. We started off by looking at the East Bay Mud watershed and the fact that it relies mostly on snowmelt. We talked about the fact that we are still in a drought and that we're all doing what we can to conserve, especially into this summer irrigation season. We reviewed um, water-wise garden maintenance tips to save water and reminded ourselves that spring is really the time to be adjusting and checking our irrigation systems and inspecting for leaks, that we want to always water to encourage deep roots, that we're using compost to build healthy soils and protecting those root zones with mulch, that we, this is the time of year to keep our weeds in check and to get out there to manually remove our weeds. And that also we always wanna be inviting beneficial insects and other garden allies in to help um, pollinate our yard and you know just really amp up the biodiversity. Finally, we covered the fact that East Bay Mud offers rebates and mulch and compost coupons uh, that might be of help to all of you. So with that, we're going to open to questions and thank you so much to my colleague, Kristen, who has been diligently answering questions in the chat, but we'll now start to answer some questions live with Suzanne and I. And I did just see a question come in. We will be sending the recording and the slides and all of the links and resources that we mentioned out in a follow-up email to every single person who's registered today. Um, additionally, once this webinar is over, you will have a survey pop up on the screen. And we always ask that you do fill that out because it really helps us as we work to tailor our future webinars. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the questions. So I see one here at the top, Suzanne, that says, I was told by a nursery that my organic matter amendment needed to be 50% new, uh, bought or from compost each year for a raised bed. Does this seem right to you? Um, that's a really great question. And um, it kind of depends on the ingredients of the compost. Some ingredients are going to uh, actually be um, a blend 
that so they're not exactly they're not pure compost like for instance planting mix is going to be a blend more of a you know a balanced uh material that you can just plant right into however when we're amending the soil and for we're planting plants for the first time and we're spot amending we're not necessarily you know turning in compost to like a raised bed or a garden bed we do want to mix uh, amend the soil that is going to be right near the root zone of that new plant 50 50 okay that is true however when we have a uh, blank slate like a raised bed uh, for instance i just prepped a raised bed for some lettuces i uh, literally put an inch of compost on top and i just turned it into the top few inches and my soil i know is really healthy and very fluffy and light uh, however, it just needed a little bit of oomph, a little bit more microbiology, uh, and then I also included some fertilizers just so that microbiology could be off to a good start. So it kind of depends. Again, if you've got really crummy clay, you might want to mix in, you know, uh, compost, let's say 25% uh, just to get it started, uh, just so we could start to amend that soil and really increase the uh, structure of that soil. However, um, I think 50-50 was maybe, um, uh, I think they meant, or the misinterpretation is they really means at time of planting, if we're just spot amending. Perfect, thanks for that answer, Suzanne. Okay, another question that came in, and just as a reminder, everyone, you can, type your questions into the Q&A box if you do have them. So another question, any tips for avoiding powdery mildew on peas and cucumbers? How to prevent it or how to get rid of it would be helpful. Yeah, powdery mildew uh, starts to appear when things are dry and warm. Powdery mildew, unlike other common garden funguses, such as black spot or rust actually thrives on warm temperatures that are really 65 to 85 and dry conditions. The spores will blow in the wind and some plants are just really prone to it. So a couple of things to keep in mind, we wanna increase that air circulation. I like to remove any leaves that start to show signs of powdery mildew. And I really wanna make sure I'm absolutely only fertilizing with organic fertilizers because believe it or not, synthetic fertilizers um, can actually increase the powdery mildew on the plants. Now, the way that we can uh, mitigate that powdery mildew is if we're not going to remove the leaves, like if there's just a few leaves on the plant, we want to get a spray bottle that has just water on it and then syringe the blast, the, um, the powdery mildew off the bottom of the leaves and on top of the leaves. We just kind of want to wash it off because water actually pops all those spores. We want to do this early in the day so any water droplets can dry by the end of the day. Great, thank you. Okay, I see another great question here. Are there different types of mulch? Oh yeah, there's lots of different types of mulch. In fact, people can use compost as mulch. Um, uh, that is fine. Uh, I like to actually put a layer of compost, but then I'm going to put wood chips because the wood chips have a tendency to really lock in that moisture even more. Uh, mulch can be uh, pea gravel, decomposed granite. It could be uh, oyster shells that are crushed. It could be rubber tires that have been processed to be mulch. There's so many different types of mulch. Remember, mulch is just going to be a protective layer that is uh, placed on top of the soil. I'm a fan of, of course, anything that's going to be organic, like wood chips. Uh, um, and then of course, you know, pea gravel or some type of um, non-combustible around the structures of buildings, but um, that's going to be my choice. Great, thank you. Okay, here's another good one. I'd like to know how often I should water newly planted shrubs like boxwood, flowers like floribunda roses, sunset gold. I'm currently watering them on a drip system for 10 minutes every two days. Um, shall I do more, more days, more time, any suggestions? Okay, thank you so much for answering the, asking that question um, because this is a perfect example that it depends. Okay, so 
when we buy a plant at the nursery, it is in a pot. Okay, so let's pretend it's in a four inch pot, like that's my imaginary pot. And in that pot, it, that's the root zone. The root zone can only grow as big as the pot allows. When we plant it in the ground, we've, you know, we've scored those roots. We've like kind of loosened the roots up so we can start encouraging them to grow out and down. And we've amended that soil with that 50% compost to our native soil. So it really can start to stretch and grow. But at the beginning, we're plant, or this plant, let's say this is the plant, this is the pot. At the beginning, the root zone is only right here. Maybe it's going to expand about an inch further than the original you know, root zone, the original shape of the pot. So we want to focus the water just about an inch beyond the root zone. And then as the weeks pass, those root zones are growing. So now we're going to focus the water a few more inches out and we're actually going to let that water go a little bit longer so that it can really go even deeper. Okay, so over time, we want to water out and down. So we're watering more water. So at the beginning, we might only be watering, let's just say uh, a pint of water would be sufficient. But then over time, it's going to be maybe a half a gallon. And then over time, it might be a gallon. And now we're making sure that the root zone all the way around the plant is getting nice, even watering deeply. So we wanna gauge that water and we wanna to try to get that water down eight to 12 inches, give or take. And then we're not watering again until the top three, four, even five inches is dry once the plants are established. So for your plants, um, depending on the size of the pot, depends on the size of the root zone, we're going to get out there and we're gonna put our fingers in the soil and we're gonna see when is the soil dry. When has the soil dried out enough for us to water again? And now if we've got that two inches or three inches of mulch on top, especially protecting those root zones, I bet right now you're probably not watering more than once a week, maybe even less than that. Especially if you're in an area that's a little cooler, that has shorter days, you know, that's getting more shade. Uh, it really depends. So I know I, that's, that's, that's the problem. It depends. Well, Thank you. That was a really great answer to, it is a complex question. Um, so for sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and 